This is my sliding table saw. Whee! Oh, I now have the saw for more than six years now, and ever since I had it for like one year, people were already asking me to do a long-term review and do I still like this saw, would I recommend it, would I buy this again, all these questions. I try to answer them now, and as you could already read from the title, it also needs some upgrades, but we'll get to that. So first of all, this saw is the Hammer K3 Basic. The saw is made by the Felder Group, and at the time of making this video, this is still the smallest saw they make. But for the average woodworker, this saw is by no means small. It also weighs over 250 kilograms, so it's still quite a beast. It takes blades up to 315 millimeters in diameter, or in the complicated way, 12 and... Uh, 12 and 51, 127 inches. Hell no. And with that, it has a cutting capacity of up to 102 millimeters, or just over four inches. I've also already used it a couple times at its max capacity, and that worked perfectly fine. I have this saw equipped with a four horsepower motor, which is the standard. You could also get it with a bigger 5.5 horsepower motor. But for me, that has always been enough. I'm very satisfied and happy with the power this saw offers. So, motor is great. Want to see it? Have a look right here. There it is. And here's also the drive belt you can see. And I had zero problems with that. The belt is still fine. I never had slipping issues or anything. That's very well made. Let's take a closer look at the guts of the saw, starting with the elbow. Let's also remove that cover here. At the other side of the belt, you can see the arbor, which is basically one big shaft. Also, the pulley is machined onto this shaft. This is very well made. I have no issues with the bearings at all, which are somewhere in here. Belt tension is still the same as it was six years ago. No issues with that, that is very well made. With this cover removed, you can also see the mechanism how the riving knife is kept parallel to the table as I tilt up the blade. It's a parallel mechanism and that works pretty nicely. This piece of metal is where the riving knife is attached to and as you just could see, it also always moves up and down with the blade when raising and lowering it, but still has no side-to-side -side play or whatever. It's perfectly solid and that's exactly what it's supposed to do. The adjusting mechanism for the riving knife is not the most user-friendly, so just this bolt here for moving it front and back and up and down. No quick connection system or anything here. That's kind of unfortunate, but on the other hand, this is very solid. Hmm, it's kind of fun taking all of this apart and take a closer look. Let's remove this dust shroud as well. Oops. Yeah, let's just put this down here. It is dusty underneath there. Here now can see how the raising and lowering mechanism works. Uh, it would be better without the sliding table. Let's remove it. I've done that before. It went smoother. I forgot to remove one more little part. Now you can see the mechanism pretty well. So there's a giant pin in the front here, which is, I don't know, a shaft with 25 millimeter diameter which this whole arm here hinges on. And here is a guide with two brass, no, only, I, I guess two brass washers that go along this slot and that makes sure that this lever arm is guided straight. Ah. I guess the threads need some lubrication. Here's the spindle for adjusting the tilt of the blade. And I first have to unlock it and then can tilt everything. And the whole assembly, so this lever arm that raises the blade up and down, where also the motor is attached, is mounted to this plate here. And this hinges in these brass hinges, I guess. And that's how the saw is hung from the table and tilts. Here you can see the adjusting ring, which is the positive stop for 45 degrees. And I set that once six years ago, and this is still exactly 45 degrees. Back there on the other end of the spindle for the tilting, you can see the other adjustment ring, which is the positive stop for 90 degrees. And that also is still perfectly fine. Here you can see a little bit of buildup of lubrication with dust or anything. 
but I have zero issues with that and I don't think it's worth re-lubricating this because it would look like this immediately again with all the dust. So here I go with the saying, never fix a running system. The only issue this tilting mechanism has, which isn't a really big one, is at about 27 degrees. Because right there, the center of mass of this whole assembly is in line with the hinges, which means if this whole tilt spindle wasn't there, this assembly would swing to this angle. With this installed, that means it can easily rock within the play of the threads. So at this angle, it's extremely important to lock the angle in place. And then this is no issue. The bigger issue is reaching the threads of the raising mechanism to lubricate them. They are right here, but focus won't show you. Come on, there. Much better with some lubrication. Another problem I had with the raising mechanism is with the hand wheel, but I already fixed that. This is removable and is used on both the raising and tilting spindle. With the blade raised up, this spindle is slightly tilted down and when I turn off the saw, the motor brake kicks in and vibrates a little bit. And that always vibrated the handle off of this pin here. And then you would crank into nothing and that's just frustrating and annoying. I fixed that with this magnet and drilled a hole through the handle, put a screw down there, it's relatively loose. And that is enough to keep the handle on during the vibration. You probably already have seen the two pins at the arbor that also stick through the blade and through the arbor flange. And I'm not certain what their real purpose is. It could be to transfer the power properly to the blade or to prevent this screw from unscrewing itself during use or during braking. Could also be both. With the blade installed, I can also check for wobble. And as you can see, that also looks pretty good. And that's all I can say about this part of the saw. Maybe also interesting is to see how it looks on the inside with the dust buildup. There is quite some dust there, which is to be expected after six years. And there's also how the dust collection is done underneath here with this hose. There's one thing worth mentioning. I once had a piece about this size being shot into the dust shroud and to the hose. And it also punched a hole Ruder hose, quite a violent, but it didn't affect dust collection performance, so I didn't care about it. Next, have a look at the sliding table that I conveniently already disassembled. It basically works the same as a normal ball bearing, straightened out. And now the inner race of the bearing would be this part of the sliding table. The balls are right here, and the other race is the sliding table itself. The surfaces where the bolts touch are hardened pieces of steel embedded into the aluminum extrusion. Same on the sliding table part. On this piece there are also many screws on one side and that's to adjust the tension along the table assembly by tilting this section in or out. But that's done in the factory and worked perfectly ever since. The ball cages are roughly spaced apart and held in place with this piece of sheet metal. And like this I can assemble it again. The sliding table itself is basically still flawless. It has zero play in any position and works smoothly, even with weight on it. Of course, it's not as butter smooth as a brand new one, but this is more than good enough for anything you do on a saw. It also required zero maintenance so far. I would never buy a saw without a sliding table anymore. It's so much better than having slots in a table. Of course, it's very expensive but depending on how much you use it, definitely worth it. The fence is something I like and hate the most about this saw. What I like is that it's accurate and has never changed ever since I've set it up. I had to do this myself and there are four screws on this aluminum extrusion here that it rides on and I spent about an hour to get it straight to the blade and 90 degrees to the table, but that hasn't changed. The other awesome part is that you can slide the fence rail back. And with it behind the blade, you can use it as a stop block for repeatable cuts. And that is just awesome. I used it all the time. Now to the part I hate, adjusting it. You do that by pulling up on this cam lever and then you can move it. So far so good. What you can't see, what I need to do is I need to pull on the lever slightly to make it work smoothly. Kind of. If I don't do that and just push on the handle, it jams itself. You might say, well, just push it here. Then it works, but I have to hold up this handle because if I let go of it, the weight of it 
is enough to lock it somewhat in place and then you can't move it. If I push it all the way up, this also locks the fence in place. Why? I don't know. So to do really fine or smooth adjustments, you have to do it two-handed. Why? This is such bullshit. No way to do fine single-handed adjustments. I want to fix it and I have a few ideas for some over-engineered solutions, but not in this video. So far so good for the long-term review. I give my conclusion at the end of the video. Now let's do some upgrades. First of all, the handle on the sliding table. I like it, I use it, but it should be a flip handle to flip it out of the way. Easy enough. Ah, much better. My space in between the workbench edge and the sliding table handle is not very big and I caught myself so often on this handle. This makes a big difference for me. Next upgrade is for the crosscut fence. This one that came with the saw is perfectly fine. Let's just install it. Butt up against here, flip out this piece and clamp it down. Little side note on this flipper piece, I'm responsible for its existence. The original one didn't work so well and you have to count on that because this is responsible for the fence being 90 degrees to the blade. And you can count on that. And of course this fence also works for angled cuts in both directions. But I would like to have a second fence that's more like a crosscut sled with a fixed 90 degrees and that is a lot quicker to install. So let's do that. I bought myself a second fence rail for that. They only had a longer one in stock but I can live with that. It also came with a second flip stop. The flip stop by the way is perfectly flawless. I really like that. I will use the shorter rail for the new fence though because that's lighter and that's better for mounting it quickly. The slot width in the sliding table that I can work with is only about 11 millimeters and using a wooden strip for that feels kind of flimsy, especially with only these two small surfaces touching it. So the next idea is to turn a shaft to the exact dimension. The slot in the sliding table measures 11.17 millimeters and my shaft now measures 11.16 or 17 as well. Since that would have been too tight, I sanded the shaft to remove a little bit more and improve the surface finish. And that removed about 300th, 11.14 now. Then I cut it in half and cleaned and chamfered the ends. The pieces now look like this and if everything went well, this should just drop into the slot. Hmm, and it doesn't. That's a bit too tight. I guess it's because the best tool I had to measure the width of the slot is this. And that's not as good as this. I should be able to tweak the fit with some careful filing, but if that doesn't work, I just do it again. Let's go for now. I next need a flat spot to properly screw it to a board. And I also need that flat spot to properly drill a threaded hole into it. And I also need that flat spot because at the moment, the widest part of that pin is not properly engaging with the slot. If I remove this drill bit here that holds it up, it falls down and that shouldn't be the case. I already did it for the first one on my CNC router for wood and that worked pretty good. A flat and even surface. The program for this operation is a code for flattening workpieces that I actually wrote myself. But it also works for this since this basically is a flattening procedure. The bit is a hard milling bit that doesn't need cooling and also cooling would destroy the MDF work table of the machine, so cutting dry it is. It looks good. I now cut this board to size. It has a very hard veneer and I need that. These two pieces will get screwed to that, to the underside of course, then I have this piece in the front and the fence rail gets bolted to that. Pretty straightforward. They're a bit loose now and when I put them into the slots they align to each other. And now this has a little bit of adjustment room for the perfect 90 degrees and when that's done I can tighten that down. But I'll do that at the end when it's done, first some more assembly. Unfortunately, this didn't came out perfectly square, as you can tell from the light gap. 
So I made some blocks with a bolt in them, which allows me to push or pull on the front piece. With this now, I can fine adjust the angle of the front. So far so good, but next I need a locking system. I bought this kind of cam lever clamp that I want to use. And I like the idea of these kind of T-nuts that you can slide through the slot and when you rotate, then you can pull on it. The slot in the sliding table is for M10, but I only could find this clamp with M8 threads. So I need kind of an M8 bolt that has a T-nut thing on the end that works with the slots. Maybe cutting a carriage bolt down works as well. Sounds like a job for a big ass file. Something like this. Yeah, that should work. Put it in, turn it around and clamp it down. Perfect. The clamp and the T-bolt must be fixed together somehow so that this can't rotate anymore. I guess Loctite will do the trick here. While I'm waiting for some finish to dry, I can tweak the fit of these pins a little bit so it's not as tight as it is. So I mounted them to some scrap wood and with a grinding stone, I can take away just a little bit more material. And there you can see where I'm grinding. When I test them individually, this one now seems spot on. And this one, not the tiniest bit of play. But together now it's just right. I don't have to force it in and zero play. I've done a few more aesthetic things, finished it, and these pieces are now also glued in place with two dowels so they don't move. The Loctite dried for actually two days and holds together now very well. So this should now just work. And it doesn't. But the very cool feature about this cam clamp, the reason why I got it, it has this adjustment ring. And with that I can now fine adjust the tension to exactly what I want. Now it works perfectly. Oh yeah, I see myself getting used to that. Next, setting it up square, I first aligned it against the standard fence as good as possible and then made a 5 cut test, which is, I guess, state of the art for testing a square cut. You make 5 cuts to a random board and the freshly cut edge always goes against the fence for the next cut. And on the 5th cut, you cut off a strip and keep that. Any misalignment of the fence adds up 4 times and can then be measured on that strip. I measure about 3.62 in the front and 4.3 in the back. That means that over four times the length of the strip, which is 40 centimeters, so over the length of 1 meter 60, I'm off of about 0.7 millimeters. That's really good, but I think we can do even better. Since the strip is wider in the back, an exaggeration would be that the fence is like this and I need to adjust it in the opposite direction. Loosen the screws for the adjustment, but I think it's so tiny you won't even notice it. After the first adjustment it got a bit better, but I wanted more. Then I over adjusted and made it worse. And on the last adjustment I now got it the same thickness within a tenth of a millimeter. That's good enough. Next I made another piece to mount an end cap to the rail. This sits pretty nicely in the end here. And I hope that with installing this threaded insert, that this kind of jams it in place. Okay, this doesn't work. Let's see if it works when I install a screw here. When it's fully seated. Seems to hold. Doesn't hold. <laughs> then I did it properly and drilled a hole into the fence for a screw. The end cap is just a small piece of plywood that I made flush with the front and a knocked on furniture bolt works best here since it has a big but flat head. And then I cut this to be flush with the blade. The last few details are adjusting the scale for the flip stop and making a wall holder. Now that this is done, I also realize how much I missed having a fence that is flush to the blade with this end cap. Because when I mark the length of a piece directly on it with a pencil, I can just line it up against that end cap and cut it to length. That is so convenient and I didn't have that for the past six years. Why the hell didn't I make that 
earlier. It literally took me 10 minutes to make that. <sighs> Anyhow, on to the next upgrade. Which also comes from a problem when using the crosscut fence with pieces that are longer than double the width of the sliding table because all of them will tip down. Not really that big of a deal and holding them in place worked great so far. But the solution to this problem is so simple, just adding another little platform to the fence rail. I guess the convenience is worth making that. I took a scrap piece of plywood and cut some box strands into it with a box strand jig that I haven't used in a long time. I've cut the part with the box strands into four individual pieces. These already have the hole for the mounting bolts. The joint itself fits together really nicely. The alignment is pretty much off, but I'll trim cut that once it's glued together. With glue, the joint got a bit tight. The angle looks good. And a straw takes care of the glue squeeze out. Here, the new fence with the end cap is useful already. Whee! With the T-nut and the bolt, this gets mounted to the back of this rail. And that fixes the problem. The distance at which this has to be mounted needs to be a little bit less than the width of the sliding table. It measures about 29 centimeters, so I made the gap about 27. And that makes sure that it works for every workpiece length. I again added a few more aesthetics and a finish. And one little important detail right here, which is this little chamfer here. And that allows the workpiece edge to easily slide onto the platform and never get caught on its edge. Instead of this, I could also use the extension table that I can mount to the side of the sliding table. But this also has a problem. So the next upgrade is for this extension table. This can be mounted in the back or on the side on the sliding table. But let me show you what it takes to mount it to the sliding table and I guess then you'll see the problem. It takes ages to install and although now it's really solid and great, it's inconvenient and stuff that's inconvenient won't get used. Guess what? I barely use it on the sliding table. I use it all the time in the back because there takes two seconds to install and that's how it should be on the sliding table side as well. So let's do that. Since the vertical alignment is given by these two screws resting in the slot and the tilting alignment given by these two bolts, I only need a different way of clamping it. And I guess the solution is to not reuse these keyholes that are used in the back and not having removable hardware, like this. So I ordered two more of these clamps, one for either side, but maybe also just one in the middle is enough. And I only need to drill one more hole into the table. I have the clamp installed with a washer and a carriage bolt, and I still need to slide it in from the back, but that would be okay. But I'm trying for a while now and I'm having a hard time getting this work nicely. At the moment, that's not better than before. And also when it's clamped down, it's not as good as before. And also getting it out again, not so good. So my second attempt has two more holes, more parts and both clamps. Now I've already adjusted the tension and can just install that. Slides right in. And when it's there, I pull on both levers at the same time and I'm done. And I would say it's almost as solid as before, but definitely solid enough for me. When I uninstall it, you can see I have two screwed in magnets. So when I pull this up, it stays up and I have both hands for guiding it out of the slot. It also still works and doesn't interfere with my wall holder. And it also doesn't interfere with the mount in the back. This is exactly what I wanted. So much better than before. Everything integrated, no additional parts. That's how it should be from the beginning. However, I paid about 15 bucks each for the clamps, so quite expensive. 
But then again you get one of these tables with the saw, an additional one is about a hundred bucks and if it's too inconvenient to use, it's a lot of wasted money. So maybe hard to justify, but I guess worth it. These are all the upgrades for now. I like all of them, so much added convenience. I also have a few more upgrades in mind, but didn't have the time for now. And I also did an upgrade for the table saw insert plate and recorded that, but that escalated a little bit and it's worth its own video. So now to the conclusion. Can I recommend this saw? Would I buy it again? The answer is yes and no. I wouldn't buy this one again, the K3 Basic. I would buy the K3 Winner. And I would have done it in the beginning, but it wouldn't have fit through the door. The Basic has just a slightly smaller base that fit through the door. So I had no choice in getting this. The big difference with the Winner is the fence system. I've used it on a real machine and it's a hundred times better than this one. It glides easily all the way through. It has integrated fine adjustment compared to this one like day and night. So I really can recommend the K3 winner just because of the fence system. Sliding table, guts of the saw is exactly the same as on this one, but I wouldn't recommend the basic. So if you're really interested in getting a really good table saw, get the K3 winner or the Felder ones, but that's a whole other price range. However, the investment of 3680 euros was well worth it. I have no need in replacing this saw anytime soon. It's a great saw and I'm sure it will continue being a great saw for the coming years. Now even more with all the upgrades and the ones that will come in the future.